welcome to the Retro Cranbrook Archives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today. I know this is a busy, busy, busy time of year. Um, if it was last weekend, I'd be wishing you Merry Christmas. I think I was shoveling last weekend. But we always open with either a word of prayer or O Canada. With the elections coming on, I think O Canada is appropriate today. Let's stand and sing O Canada. O Canada. Saturday night in Canada. Shoots and scores. <laughs> yeah. This is a fine place that we live in, and I'm, when we sing O Canada, we should think about the freedoms we have in this great land. And those freedoms continue to be here, but without, without good stewardship, and without our concerns, and without the things that we do we stand a good chance of losing some of those freedoms. I have had the privilege to working with the city of Cranbrook uh, as the Deer Committee Chair, and I'll mention that a little later. But at the meantime, I'd ask uh, my good friend and buddy Scott Manjack, Mayor of Cranbrook, to say a few words. Thank you, Carmen, and uh, thank you for doing the Deer Committee when, you know, in most communities, the deer issue is big, and when I was, when the council was starting to get a lot of pressure on this thing, I said, who would be the man to look after the deer issue in Cranbrook? And I went, 
Carmen Purdy. And I can tell you, uh, as a just, I don't, didn't really want to talk about this, but uh, Carmen and his committee have done an outstanding job for uh, Cranbrook in, in framing this issue, putting a plan forward. Um, yeah, as we all know, Bill, um, Carmen has a strong relationship with our MLA bill, and uh, so we're going to work with the province, and uh, we'll be one of the first communities, in my opinion, in British Columbia that will take a real proactive and progressive approach to dealing with urban deer. Uh, now, why I'm here. First, I want to welcome everyone for coming uh, out on a Sunday to this very important meeting and uh, a very important organization. I, when we were here about a year ago when Carmen first got this going, I said to the group, you know, when Carmen says something that's important in Cram when he says that, and those of us in Cramrick that know Carmen, we know that if Carmen thinks it's an important issue, it is an important issue, and access to our backcountry and to our resources is probably, there's probably not more important issue in this area and in the, this province or in this country than access. And I, you know, I would ask ourselves a couple questions, one being, could you imagine right now if there was an application to develop the Elk Valley coal fields? We know what the employment that that area brings. We know the revenue that it brings to our communities. We know the revenue it brings to the province. But can you imagine if that application was before the, the province or the, or the federal government right now? The opposition to that from the environmental groups would be outrageous. And I don't even know if we would get it through. And that's why I think this process and this organization is so important. Access to our resources is probably one of the key components to any municipality or region as we grow our communities. And if we don't have that access, our province suffers and our community suffers. So that's one component. The second one is, is access to our backcountry. I look around the room, I see many folks I know, hunters, fishers, hikers, berry pickers. Again, that's part of the culture and fabric of our communities. And we're having problems with that. And I think the good news is, since we last met, uh, those of us that are local politicians in the room, I think there's only me and and the Mayor of Sparwood um, that I can see. Uh, when we were down at our annual convention in September, through the hard work of Bill and Carmen, the Premier of British Columbia, put this issue on the agenda. And I think there's no, I don't think we could ask for any more recognition than I, as I said earlier, I think that's to the hard work of, of Bill and, and, and working with his government and Carmen and you, this group here that's put this issue front and center for all, this, for all of us. So, you know, I can't say enough how important it is as a mayor as I said, it's a cultural issue, it's, a, it's an economic issue, and it's a quality and a way of life issue for us that live in the rural area. So I want to thank Carmen and everyone for coming out this, uh, this afternoon to this important meeting. Access B, BC needs to be strong. We need to be able to counter the environmental movement, which is organized, funded and dedicated to their cause. As a mayor, I can tell you, I see it every day. As the chair of the Regional District of East Kootenai, I cannot tell you the pressures that we see from those groups on the land base. As we try to grow our economies and grow our communities, these folks are working harder to make sure that they don't grow, that the projects don't go forward, and that our access to the, to the land and to the country we love is being inhibited, and we got to make sure that we are strong and stronger than them. So, Carmen, thank you for inviting me. On behalf of City Council and my community, I welcome you to Cranbrook, for those of you that are out of town, and um, again, Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. It's not one person that makes a difference. It's a, it's a number of people who can and will and do make a difference. I've been uh, accused of many things, and I, I know that where I stand on environmental issues are what I consider to be conservation issues. Last year we had 160 people here and I did send a letter to every one of our members. Our membership is like 34 pages long now. And it's, uh, it's growing. We have, we have members here that uh, are from Nelson. And I would like to uh, ask the Nelson District uh, Rod and Gun Club to come forward. They bought a, a, an affiliate membership or a corporate membership. And uh, that means that we now represent the Nelson District Rod and Gun Club, so I'd ask him to come forward. I'd like to get the Fernie Rod and Gun Club on the same page. They had a meeting yesterday. How many do you have, Mario? Just under 500. Just under 500. They have just over 500 members in the Fernie Rod and Gun Club. Thank you. Why didn't I shake your hand?
they have just over 500 members in the Fernie Rodden Gun Club. That means that one out of eight people in Fernie belong to the Fernie Rodden Gun Club. 2,500 in Fernie for 10% or more belong to our club. Yeah, but that, that, and that's through the efforts of people like Mario. They have the same ethic. They have the same good stewardship about them. We talked, when Scott talked about the coal fields in the Elk Valley, I remember one regional biologist saying that we'll put a bronze statue at Sparwood. And we'll put a bronze statue at Elkford. It would be a bronze statue of a moose or a sheep because they, that will be the only thing that people will remember the moose and the sheep by in the Elk Valley. That goes back a ways, but I'm telling you, they have the most productive wildlife populations in the entire Kootenays in the Elk Valley. And it's a lot to do with coal mining and the, the, what happens there. Eagle Plains Resources Limited also bought a corporate membership. And I don't know if there's anyone here from Eagle Plains. Tim here? Come on up and pick this up. They, and uh, hang it on the wall proudly. They're a member of Access BC. These people who are buying the corporate and, and the affiliate memberships will increase our numbers exponentially. Uh, one at a time is hard. Uh, with Tech Cominco buying one, that's, that's a lot. Thank you, Dave. I'm the director. Dave is the director. I went into Bridge Interiors and Bridge uh, Interiors uh, he said, what do you need? And I said, something for the raffle table. And he said, I'll give you that $300 down duvet. Um, and that'll go a little later to some lucky person. And he said, what else? And he said, I said, what about a membership? He said, how much is it? For an affiliate membership, it's $250. There'll be a check in the mail. And so I have a bridge interior one here as well at this point. This is in the last week. I'll, get, I'll make sure Kenny Bridge gets this. We should also look around and see on the wall here uh, those people who have uh, helped us. Uh, I hate red ink, absolutely. Can't, it's not a part of my life. I don't like it at all. So if you look around, you can see, and thank you, Alan Gordon, your family for coming through. And that, that, I didn't put my brother's name on there, but Oscar, my oldest brother, built that Romoli uh, board last year. I was supposed to get it out of here and I forgot it in the truck. So much for that. Look at those sponsors and support them, please. Last year I told a couple of funny stories. I think they're still funny. I was looking at them today. An elderly man in Louisiana had owned a large farm for several years. He had a large pond in the back. It was property shaped for swimming, so he fixed it up nice with picnic tables, horseshoes, courts, and some apples and peach trees. One evening, the old farmer decided to go down to the pond, and as he hadn't been there for a while, and he looked it over. He grabbed a five-gallon bucket to bring back some fruit. As he neared the pond, he heard voices shouting and laughing with glee. As he came closer, he saw it was a bunch of young women skinny dipping in his pond. He made the women aware of his presence, and they all went into the deep end. One of the women shouted to him, we're not coming out until you leave. The old man frowned. I didn't come here down here to watch you ladies swim naked or make you get out of the pond naked. Holding the bucket up, he said, I'm here to feed the alligator. <laughs> uh, I can relate to that. Whenever we, we do things like Access BC, we're here to feed the alligator. Uh, we need people to stir. We have to stir them. And, and the only way to stir government is to be really close to them, and I'm really close to my good friend Bill Bennett, and I'm proud to call him my good friend. And the other way is through memberships. In, in front of you, each one of you has an Access BC membership. And I would, my challenge is just to sell one membership this week so that we can double the crowd that we have here next year and make sure that when you sell it, you tell them you're coming to Access BC's annual general meeting, and it'll be in March next year, not in conjunction with an archery shoot that's lasting all weekend. The trap and skeet ground, the boys out there, most of them belong. Uh, they are out there today in their annual general meeting in the shoot. Uh, there's uh, the Fernie Rod and Gun Club last night, had over 500 people, I think, uh, attending their <laughs> annual general meeting. There's just so much going on right now that it was... Uh, I picked a kind of a bad time, and I guess that's not why, that's one of the reasons I didn't sleep too good last night. Uh, I will say that we have political people here, 
And uh, Dave Wilkes, of course, is, is with us. He's the mayor of, uh, of uh, Sparwood. And Dave is the new candidate that's going to be replacing uh, Jim Abbott in, as a member of parliament in our federal government. It's totally important that we have a federal government representative who understands the needs and the wants and the aspirations of not only the people, but what makes the country tick. And I think that Scott elaborated on that a bit. And economics is not only about money. Economics is about every act of environmental protection is an economic decision. Putting 25% of the Kootenays aside wrecks havoc on the economy. And the 12 million acre Musqua Kachika the same. And locking up huge areas of old growth forests are all economic decisions. Most people don't know it, but in the Purcell wilderness, when I was working, there was 70 billion or 70 million uh, cubic meters of wood standing, big stuff. Uh, Tembek cuts roughly a million cubic meters a year. We were all told it was rock, ice, and snow, and most people hadn't ever been there. I've been there a few times. I saw 40 bulls in one creek in one afternoon, me and Malinka and John Murray and Rolf Ganong. And we parked the helicopter in the Purcell Wilderness and had lunch. We weren't supposed to do that. We were supposed to get a permit to do that, but we didn't. 40 bulls, big bulls in a place called Port Creek. Bears, uh, we, we got lots of them. But economic decisions are things like locking up the Mackenzie Valley in, in a park, the Muskwal Kachika, the Tashinshini. The TAP is a mining operation. Two holes are worth $5 billion. We as a country can't afford those kinds of decisions. We can't. We absolutely can't. I'm an old guy. I'm, you know, I'm old growth myself. I'm 71 years old. I used to call my dad old growth and he's 83 and I loved him dearly. And I miss him dearly. But I'll tell you what, I knew that I wasn't going to have him forever. And we are not going to have those forests forever either. But we could use them, we could utilize them. It would be a huge boon to our economy. There's several places, we say we're running out of wood, but there's lots of places where we've taken wood and locked it up. And I'm not saying doing it in a poor way, but doing it in a way that is good stewardship. That's what it's all about. We've got to be good stewards. And good stewards of the land is totally important to all of us. I got a letter the other day, dated April 5th, 2011. It was from a fellow, a friend of mine, his name is uh, Jack Caradice. And Jack was an, uh, a bureaucrat forever, wrote several books, and it is really a brilliant guy. And he wrote short notes that plus his, his membership in a, in a donation of $100, I think. Dear Carmen, I hope you get something moving on this. It is a major problem, and nobody seems to understand how important it is. Well, that's not true. Uh, we have people who do understand how important it is, and they're sitting in this room. And we do understand that it's really good for the, our economy, and we know that we, we can share uh, the resources instead of taking them out. And one of the way, way that we take them out, or collectively, it's, they are taken out, is through access control and taking and putting boundaries around what you and I can do all the time. I could go on for a long time on the number of letters, I got two inches thick letters from various people across the province. And it's a question of having enough resources to continue to open up minds of people, do some education, but mainly those people that have used resource roads that have been in place for long periods of time are being taken away. My own trap line on Hawkins Creek, every road and every side road is cross-stitched and even the main road on the back is cross-stitched. You all are familiar with cross-stitching. This past weekend, a week Saturday, uh, a week ago Saturday, a young fellow was skidooing in, in uh, Galloway Creek. I'm very familiar with Galloway Creek. It was my trap line for 10 years, and I know exactly what happens in Galloway Creek. And my son, Kurt, who's here today with his boys, uh, tells me that every road in, Gall in Hawkins Creek, or, uh, Perry Creek is, is cross-stitched, and some of them are really deep. This young fellow was going up Galloway Creek to come over the top with a group of people, and he hit a cross-stitch. This isn't a cross stitch, it was a tank trap. He went into the ditch and had a double fractured femur in his right leg. That double fractured femur uh, would, could, would and could probably kill a person, if, especially if it was compound and you severed the femoral artery. E even with just a fractured femur, you lose over 20% of your body fluids in the fracture area through swelling and shock. It's a bad fracture. He got a double fracture below and above. They had to uh, call in, uh, they called the 
search and rescue and 911 and search and rescue had to take a machine and apparently this is what I heard to uh, to see whether he, they'd have to helicopter him out. That he, luckily he had good people with him. They helicoptered him out without search and rescue and they called the helicopter themselves. I was talking to a nurse who told me that we have no idea the numbers of injuries that occur as a result of hitting cross stitches. From broken wrists to broken ribs to cracked pelvises uh, to death. We had one a, a death at Elko last year where a guy hit a, hit a barrier on a road that wasn't there and they said he'd been drinking. Doesn't matter. He couldn't see the, the barrier and the barrier was covered with snow and he hit it and he was killed. I think across, if we went across the province, we would see that this happens over and over again, and we haven't just organized well enough to identify some of these things that are going on. People are going to recreate, and I can't see any good reason for destroying infrastructure and taking out bridges and taking out culverts in the dry country that we have here for most of the year. This is the NDT force type. And we multiply resources if we manage them properly. And we look at industry, industry, and due to spin-off from industry, we have one of the best, the best lives that I think any civilization has ever had in history, right here in the Kootenays. And I can see it slowly slipping. I can see it going. Uh, in the West Kootenay, it's no different. There's all kinds of places where some of the Crown land or some of the CPR lands were, were, were sold to individuals and then they started ripping up and gating and locking and blocking and chalking and taking people out that had been using those roads, for picking huckleberries and mushrooms, harvesting wood and, and using them winter and summer and freely doing it. And it, some of those roads lead to crown land but still they still gate and lock and chalk and block them and those things have to be looked at in the long term. I think that the, the, the mining, trapping, and forest industry Without access, we wouldn't have it. We just wouldn't have it. Agriculture, tourism, oil and gas and energy, without access, we wouldn't have them. But they're all wealth generators. Poverty, poverty, poverty is poor feed for the environment. It does, it's, it's no good. And I think there's far-sighted individuals, like Bill Bennett, who believe that access to resources is absolutely essential and necessary, and maintained access is absolutely essential and necessary. It's our way of life. It's our freedom to move on the land. It makes us the people that we are. I get really passionate about this. It's hard to believe that Saskatchewan now is number one in Canada. <laughs> and I'm no insult to anybody here from Saskatchewan, but the reason that they weren't before for 22 long years was that they didn't have access to the resources in a reasonable way. And now we see that the government's changed and in a short time, it didn't take long. The, those those uh, people in Saskatchewan are, are benefiting by one of the best life uh, styles that we can see. And I only wish that I'd have bought about 10 houses five years ago before all of this happened. Because you could buy them for a nickel and a dime and now they're worth thousands of dollars. Access is fundamental to the creation of wealth, period. Aldo Leopold, who wrote all the stuff about Forest Service in the U.S., uh, made that statement a long time ago, and he said, basically, that the first requirement for wealth generation in forest industry and everything else in the U.S. is to have a well-maintained uh, access system in place. It was the same in, um, in Sweden, where they kill 120,000 moose a year. I don't know what we do, but it's nowhere near that, less than 10,000. And we have twice the moose habitat, and we don't have twice the hunters, though. They have 400 and some thousand hunters there in that small country. And they, they harvest, and every other year they have to harvest more. And the reason, they, and where do they harvest them from? Roads. Some of them being built 700 years ago in that country. And they're, they're maintained. Their philosophy is that people should be able to use the resources in their country. And they ha it's a big deal there. Everybody's a berry picker, everybody mushroom picker. In fact, in some European countries, they've almost picked some mushrooms to extinction because they, they go out and pick mushrooms. And every year, uh, some, some families die, whole families die because they eat the wrong mushrooms. But that has nothing to do with the resource itself and how they use it. Everything happens there. And it's a country that's all north of 54. That would be north of, of, of Prince George. In this province, 50% of the province is de facto wilderness. 
no matter how you cut it. And most of it you don't get access to. When I drive the roads uh, in the Kootenays, I always look out and look out and look up. And I say, I wonder when the last time anybody was on that ridge. And when I'm driving my, my grandsons to Sparwood or to Jaffrey, I always say, one of these days we're going to walk that big ridge in the Iron Range and do the whole thing and take a couple days just to do it. We won't run into anybody up there. Once you're on top, I don't think you see many people. I think that the, the, the multiple resource um, use uh, circumstance applies, and it pl applies across the province. But politics, as it is, is a spectrum of activities that not everybody understands. And I, I listened to our Miss Christie, uh, our Premier, and uh, I really thank her very much for putting Bill into caucus again, and uh, hopefully he will be back into Cabinet again, because that's where he is most effective, and he does jobs for people like you and I. He makes it work. He, he, he works for us. And he isn't afraid to go against the goads or the pricks. He's, he's prepared to stand up for what we believe in and why we believe in it. But we understand the issue here. I'm not so sure they do on the coast. And on the 17th of March, on actually St. Patrick's Day, my granddaughter's birthday and my mother's birthday too, as a matter of fact, she made a statement that we have such a rich province. British Columbia is such a rich province. And it is. But the only way you can make it rich is by utilizing the resources that we have growing from the ground or digging it out of the ground. That's how we're rich. If we can manufacture, we can do all kinds of technical stuff, but we're rich because we have the resources. Locking them up, blocking them off, parking them, making special manage this, that, and the other thing without the use of the resource. We all suffer. My grandchildren will be working in Russia if we don't change our politics in regards to land and land use. Bad policies hurt, and that's who we are. We're single issue. We, I'm not looking after the whole world. I, 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 sometimes my shoulders feel like it. I, we're not looking after the whole world. We're looking after the future and access so that we can use the resources in a free way that we've done for the longest term. And if we can talk about wildlife, I'll argue with anybody about how important it is that we use them because if we don't use them, that's, that's a form of abuse. Parks don't have the wildlife that we have scattered throughout the Kootenays. They just simply don't. And they always talk about Waterton saying they're supplying the flathead with wildlife. It's exactly the opposite. Glacier National is the same. They say that you know we're, they're, they're providing our bears. What a joke. We are providing bears to those parks in the flathead. And as long as we use it and it's free uh, to be used and we log and we, and we hunt and we fish and we trap, and we should mine there too. I'm not opposed to that. And uh, I, would, I know that that would be a huge, uh, a huge matter, but I know one thing for sure. We need wealth and we need people who are here. The reason we're all here is because of what we can do here as, as a society. That's why I'm here. So I want to again thank you guys for coming. I want you to know that, that this is a pleasing to see your smiling faces. I was worried there'd only be 30 here this morning instead of 100, and so I'm happy that you're here. At this point, I, I would go to my agenda, and I, I would like to, um, first I have to find it. I'm going to ask uh, my friend, good friend, Bill Bennett, to come forward and introduce uh, our MP, Dave Wilkes. Thanks, Carmen. I've known Carmen for about 12 years, which is not nearly as long as uh, some of the other guys I see out there that have hunted with him for longer than that, but I remember meeting him the first time it was right over there against that wall. I was the president of the local chamber of commerce and I'd uh, given the speech and I think I must have said something controversial, something about the, about, uh, the East Kootenai Environmental Society, I think. 
And uh, Carmen came up to me after and he said, I like the cut of your jib. We've been friends ever since. We talk to each other, I don't know, three or four times a week probably. And uh, I admire Carmen because he has the courage of his convictions. Doesn't mean that we agree on absolutely everything, although we do agree on most things. <laughs> but uh, he has the courage of his convictions, and I, I, there's not enough of that in, in the world. There's uh, too many uh, people who are prepared to just stand aside and let things happen that they know aren't right um, and just go along with it. And uh, that's how you get yourself as a society in trouble. Uh, there's lots of uh, historical examples of that. So, Carmen, it's my pleasure to be here uh, today to support you in, in your endeavor here with Access uh, BC. Now, Carmen mentioned that uh, Mayor Dave Wilkes is, is here, and I just wanted to say just a, a few words. Uh, this isn't a political gathering, uh, but you, you can't, um, you know, you, you really can't get anything done uh, that involves Crown land unless you involve uh, government in it. You have to persuade government that changes are, are needed. And that's certainly the case with uh, the way we manage uh, resource roads in this province. And if you're going to persuade government that they need to do things differently, you pretty much got to deal with a few politicians along the way. Uh, it's pretty hard not to. Um, and I, I know I've been in, involved in this file for the last uh, 10 years, and I've worked with Dave uh, for many, I don't know how many, but many of those 10 years, first as a councillor for the District of Sparwood, and then as mayor, and, and now as the candidate for the BC Conservative Party, uh, for, sorry, for the uh, Conservative Party of Canada. Um, I'm glad he's not running for the Conservative Party of BC. Um, you know, the, the Flathead file is probably the best example of, of why having, you know, um, functioning relationships, you know, constructive relationships with some elected people. Uh, Jim Abbott uh, worked with me for the past 10 years on the Flathead file. It took both of us uh, to prevent a national park from, from going in the, in the Flathead. It took, I mean, the people lead the way on that. If, if the politicians believe that the majority of people who live in an area are, are in favor of something or opposed to something, then the politicians, if they're any good at all, are going to listen to the, to the people. And the majority of people in the Elk Valley, and I believe Cranbrook, um, are opposed to uh, putting a national park in the Flathead Valley. It's, it's, I think we believe it's not necessary. It just isn't necessary. We've had 75 years of what we've got right now, the, the, the model of management that we've got right now, with some logging there and hunting and fishing and camping and some roads and, and the other activity that takes place there. And it's one of the healthiest places on earth. You know, grizzly bear populations, populations of other wildlife, it's an extremely healthy place. So why would you change it? And that's been a successful argument. The Fernie, uh, there's quite a few guys here today from the Fernie Rod and Gun Club, and uh, they've been doing a, a fantastic job of just keeping the profile of, of the flathead up. But my, my point in raising it here today um, is that, you know, you, you have to have politicians who are um, educated about the issues. Uh, and, and can understand why you take the position that you take. Jim Abbott was somebody who educated himself, and Jim and I worked really, really closely together on the Flathead file. He would be in Ottawa, and he'd hear a rumor coming out of the National Park Service, and he'd phone me and we'd talk about it, or I'd hear something in Victoria about, you know, somebody had just paid a visit to the, to the Premier, you know, trying to persuade him to put a park in the Flathead, and we'd compare notes, and we'd go, you know, he would go and talk to ministers in the federal government, I would go and talk to ministers in the provincial government, and it, it worked well for us, uh, not just on the Flathead file, on lots of things. Um, but Jim's gone. He's retired after 17 years of being our MP. And so, of course, there's an election coming up on May 2nd, um, and we need to elect a new MP. Uh, Dave Wilkes is, is in our camp. Uh, he understands the access issues. He understands the Flathead very well. I mean, he lives, uh, lives in, in Sparwood, has a small business in Smar uh, Sparwood. Um, and I think it's important for us in, in this federal riding, this Kootenai Columbia riding, to make sure that we elect Dave because I, I can't even imagine what it would be like uh, trying to persuade uh, an NDP uh, MP to support us in our opposition to a, to a flathead park. So on May the 2nd, I hope that if you live in the Kootenai Columbia riding that you will make the effort to vote and, and uh, vote for Dave Wilkes, uh, the Conservative candidate. I want to say just a couple of quick things about access. Last year when I was here, I gave a, um, 
a longish uh, kind of speech about the, the rules on, uh, around resource roads and how they're constructed by mostly forest companies, but in some cases mining companies and oil and gas companies, how they get dis decommissioned, what the rules are around all of that. I'm not going to do that again uh, this year. One time is enough. I will tell you that um, I chaired the, what we called the Resource Roads Committee. Uh, it was a committee of cabinet ministers. I chaired it for two years. I was chairing it uh, when I was energy minister and I chaired it uh, when I was uh, uh, community and rural development minister and I sat on it as a member of that committee for two years before that. Um, last fall, uh, just before I unceremoniously left the scene, um, we had finished our resource roads report. Uh, there was a, a life uh, long a bureaucrat, a really good guy by the name of Ray Schultz, um, who had worked on it with me and we finished the report and it's sitting in Victoria uh, and it's a good report. It recommends changes to legislation um, on when roads are decommissioned. Uh, we, we kept to the principle that if a road needs to be uh, closed uh, for you know real environmental reasons then fair enough it should be closed if there's an issue of soils eroding into fish bearing streams and, and that sort of thing then you know fair enough um, but if a road was was being decommissioned uh, closed gated for the only purpose of avoiding liability either liability for the force company or liability for the crown then surely there's a way that we can figure out through legislation uh, how to get rid of that liability, to absolve ourselves and the forest companies of that liability, and keep the road open if there's no environmental reason to, uh, to close it. And we, we figured it out. Uh, the report is there. Uh, what I would, would ask you to do is, uh, you know, through your organizations, your clubs, like the Fernie Rod and Gun Club, and, and there's some of the resident hunters here uh, today, resident hunters of BC, um, and, and individually um, ask the new Premier to get that report out and, and execute it, follow through with it. I'll be doing the same thing. Um, I think we have an opportunity with her. She's quite open-minded. Um, I honestly, over the 10 years I was there, I worked on the resource roads file for 10 long years. And I, you know, uh, it's a good thing I'm not a, a quitter uh, because it, it's pretty frustrating uh, sometimes. You think you're getting, you know, you're making progress and then all of a sudden you'll be getting up close to an election and somebody will say, oh, we couldn't do that now just before an election. So you lose a, you lose a year. You come back after the election and there's a whole bunch of new priorities so you have to wind it up all over again and build the momentum and everything and then something else uh, comes up. But I, I think right now we have we have an opportunity uh, to, to, to use that report and to, to, uh, to say to government, you know, that all that work's been done over the last four or five years. Let's not have it sit on, on a shelf. Um, yeah, there's uh, the BC Wildlife Federation AGM coming up uh, next week. It would be, be good if the, if the Federation could ask, you know, could ask the government to, to follow that report, get that report out and, and, and uh, change policy on the basis of those recommendations. That was a, it was a good report. Um, I wish I could uh, stand here in front of you and, and tell you that we, you know, that government had really seen the, the light in terms of, of access and understanding the, you know, how we should be managing resource roads. Um, but, but I don't think government has, and it's because, and many of you heard me say this before, I think it's because most of the MLAs in government and, and in opposition are from cities, they're urban. Uh, the vast majority of our population lives in urban areas, um, and they're just not that interested in our issues. And if, they, if you do get a little bit of their time, they don't, they don't really get it. Uh, and, and I think they have a you know, they have a, a different view of, of the outdoors than, than we do. We're, we're mostly conservationists, I, I would think, in, in this room, and we believe that it's, it's quite appropriate to go out and, and to use the excess plants and animals that nature supplies us. We pick berries, we pick mushrooms, like Carmen says, we, we take the odd whitetail or sheep or moose or elk, and, and they're replenished. Nature does that for us, and we don't take too much. But that basic attitude of conservationism is not well understood um, in, in urban Canada. Uh, and it's not well understood in the legislatures of this country. Uh, so again, getting back to politics, uh, I hope that you'll keep me uh, hired on to, uh, to be your representative to make sure that, uh, that I keep hounding them about this kind of stuff. And I hope that you'll also uh, elect Dave Wilkes as your Conservative MP. Thank you very much.
I haven't known Dave Wilkes very long, but what I know of him, I, I like. Uh, Dave is a um, fairly straight shooter. He's kind of black and white. I have a friend like that named Rob Andrick. He, he's a he's an ex-member of the RCMP, and he's not that political. And I don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> Most people who uh, enter politics become political uh, at some point in time and run from any controversies that uh, they're faced with. I don't think Dave is of that ilk, and I would ask him to come and say a few words, and then we'll get on with uh, Mr. Clough after that. Thanks, Carmen, and I won't take as long as my other colleagues have. I'll get right to the point. Um, with regards to uh, the Flathead, I've sat on CERMAC, the Southern Rocky Mountain Access Committee, since its inception. I fought for the fact that we need access to the Flathead, and it has to remain that way. And I'll ensure that it remains that way if I elect it on May 2nd. I think it's very important. I think everyone in this room on Crown land wants to have reasonable access. Uh, when I went to the Fernie Gun Club last night, what impressed me the most, uh, Mario and Santo, was uh, the amount of kids that were there. It's unbelievable, unreal that we have that many kids that are involved in, in uh, rod and gun uh, associations that take an interest from their parents. And it's that that's going to keep everything going. So we have to make sure that that keeps going. Uh, Carmen had touched on it briefly with regards to resource extraction. Certainly in the Elk Valley with regards to Tech Coal. Tech Coal has been really responsible on how they deal with things. You can argue on certain things whether you think it's right or wrong, but at the end of the day, every train that comes through here is four million bucks. Times five, times 365. A lot of money coming through here. And we don't, do, and they take very good uh, care of the land that they do disturb, and they try to put it back to the way that was. So I think that we have to ensure that that happens as well. So I look forward to uh, moving forward on May 2nd. If any of you have any questions for me after this is done, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And he's, uh, I know he's been invited to other rod and gun clubs on, uh, around and up the valley. I'd like three young men to stand up here, my fine, strong grandsons. You guys are getting better looking every day, so Car Carmen's not going away. Thanks, guys. It's, uh, it's interesting to know when Bill talks, and, I, and you'll all remember this, and I want you to refresh your memory. And this is going to be something that will touch you because I got this email on March the 2nd. It's like, hello, what's going on here? And who's going to be involved? I remember when a senator from Montana came to Fernie. His name was Max Bacchus. And for some reason, I wasn't there with Bill that particular day. I couldn't go. Uh, it was a family event or whatever. But Bill got right in his face and asked him who invited him anyway. I was there, You'd all know the story. And I, and I can relate to that, because that is, is really who, who invited you anyway. I have a an email here from a lady out of Montana and her name is Clarice Ryan remember that name and she works with a, a senator out of Montana Auburn Curtis she's a lady now I'm going to go through what's happening in the US along the border between us and lots of this happens across borders the worst place to put a park is where it joins a park that's national to another province or international to another state. Because you will never be able to dismantle that park in the long term. I'm not advocating dismantling parks, but at some time in the future, my grandsons may have to, if they want their sons and their grandsons to stay in British Columbia and work. Because there will be resources there that are renewable or non-renewable that we will have to make use of at some point in time, like the 11 million Musqua, Maker or Musqua Kachika. The Tatch and Sheeney is one that should be open. Nobody there. I don't know why we have it. Secretary Salzer has taken congressional power for himself, he says, or she says. He's directing 
the BLM, to identify a new category of wilderness area, what he is calling wildlands. The Yak Forest comes to mind, that whole bottom end there, and of course the Flathead along, and it goes right across the province of British Columbia. This is a huge land grab, meant to bypass Congress. Only Congress is supposed to be able to designate wilderness areas. This is hot off the press. Word must get out about this quickly. Obama is eyeing Western lands for new national monuments. You don't think that puts pressure on our lands. It puts a huge pressure on our lands and it puts a huge pressure on people coming here to do the things that they like to do down there. American Land Rights Association has a page on Facebook, sign on as, as a fact and, and as a fan actually. And this is what she says. What's the wildlands problem? What's the solution? What action items are we should be doing? Wilderness areas and monuments, they're Barack. No pun intended, she's got Barack as the, you know who he is. A rose by another name, she says. Interior Secretary Selzer is calling them wildlands. He plans to get millions of acres set aside without congressional approval unless you act now. It reminds me of how many acres we set aside in BC without anybody's approval, in my mind, over things like the two million acre caribou bias. They're not going to survive. I talked to seven, seven noted wildlife biologists and I even talked to my old friend, Dr. Ian McTaggart Cowan, who was a, wasn't 100 years old when I talked to him. I had him in the East Kootenai in, about, when he was 80 and I asked him point blank, two things I want you to ask about you, Ian. Caribou, will he survive? No, he said there isn't enough of them, Carmen. The southern caribou are finished. Why don't you go on the press and tell everybody that? What good would that do me? The spotted owl was a huge thing. It was a huge thing. That's what he said. What good will that do me? The spotted owl. We find now that the spotted owl only needs about 12 and a half hectares of land to, be, to survive. They don't need 25,000. They put people out of work. There were people committing suicide. There was all kinds of things in the Washington, Idaho, Montana, in Northern California over the spotted owl. We find now that spotted owl, and Ian told me this, their cousins, the great gray, the great horn, and the, and the barred owl, they're the ones that the spotted owl has to watch because the great grays and the great horns eat them. The barred owl, uh, I don't know how to say this politely, uh, they have sex together. <laughs> and the barred owl takes over. They breed, they breed, and, then, and of course they kill them too. I got off the track here. Only Congress is supposed to designate any new wilderness areas. Secretary Salzer has decided that he can designate wilderness areas going around Congress and cutting you out of the process. He's changing the name and calling the new areas wildlands. There's a wildland project in the U.S. that comes right up into Canada. We've got to look at this. And we we're seeing it. We're seeing it. This is where the money comes from. The people here that get money out of the U.S. to the tunes of millions of dollars a year, Access BC has trouble competing with them. Just because we're not anarchists, they are, in my view. 220 million acres of unclassified multiple use lands in western states in Alaska to be set aside for review and determination. 220 million acres. Put that in, in perspective. The East Kootenai is 16.8 million acres, east and west. You're looking at big pieces of ground. All public lands will be considered for new restrictions that would limit access. Access limitations would curtail oil and natural gas leasing and development. Access limitations would restrict mining projects as well as renewable and alternate energy development. Access limitations would eliminate or reduce grazing. Access limitations would limit, uh, likely eliminate many motorized recreational uses. The new restrictions would mean no campgrounds, no off-road vehicle use, and limited or no motorized use on many of the existing roads and trails. The access limitations would mean no way stations for veterinarian or emergency facilities. Snowmobiles and snow machines use would be limited or eliminated in these new wildland areas. Your popular recreation access would be cut off. Access for the handicapped, elderly and children using traditional off-highway vehicles or snowmobiles would be eliminated. Millions of people would lose access to traditional recreational areas. Anyone can nominate lands for wildlife for wildlands designation, and it is then immediately presumed to be designated. 
BLM, BLM land use plans are then required to be amended and all activities on those lands are affected. This is a variation to the, uh, or violation 1964 Wilderness Act and this action determines every existing BLM, BLM land use plan already adopted. This action allows bureaucrats answerable to no one to impose access restrictions to lands as though they were the con had congressional power. Millions of acres of land will now be closed to the public, making them off limits of fishing, hunting, camping, riding. Does this sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Much of today's domestic oil and natural gas is produced in the affected states. More than 40% of that production comes from federal multiple use lands. Closures, I could go on. This is schools, libraries, police, fire protection, and other important funding sources would be gone from eliminating these lands. I'm talking about the U.S., of course, but does it sound familiar? It sure does to me. And I'm glad that we formed Access BC. I'm glad that we have some methods here in the Kootenays to determine what goes and what stays and who uses it and who doesn't. And I can see us losing it a bit at a time. We can't do that. We've got to get it back a bit at a time. We've got to quit doing some of the things we're doing, and that's really what Access BC is all about. It's single focus. We're looking at the mountain. I don't want to divert from it and go down to the States, but I'm telling you, they've got the same problems, and if they have the problems there, they're going to move north because we look like a big plum on a tree ready to pick. That's how they look at British Columbia. I, I shouldn't have opened up this way, Stuart. <laughs> Stuart Clough is the guy who, who does a lot of the work with the, the committee here. Uh, and you can elaborate on that, Stuart. He's, and then after that, we're going to do a, a draw, and then we're going to have, or I'm going to ask Dave Reeves after Stuart to come forward. So I know some of your background. I had your email about how many times you've moved in the last five months uh, to various ministries and various departments. And I, 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 I don't know how you guys, uh, you're standing on one foot half the time, wondering which way it's up. So Stuart, come forward and give us a brief overview of what you do and why. Thank you, Carmen. I've known Carmen, I guess people are talking about that since 1984 or five, I can't remember, when he was in Castlegar and I was there too. I'll just um, fill you in a little bit. As uh, Carmen said, I've had a few changes in the last little while. When I used to be in Integrated Land Management Bureau until the end of October. I would then was shifted into Regional Economic and Skills Development Ministry for two months. I then went to Ministry of Forest, Mines and Lands. I've written this all down. I can, no way I could remember this. I, I stayed there for two months. I went to the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism and Innovation. And last Tuesday, I was put into the Ministry of Forest, Lands and Natural Resource Operations, which is now under review by um, uh, Secretary Randy Hawes, and I'll be somewhere else shortly. Anyhow, my job hasn't really changed much. One of the things I do, uh, or the only thing I do, I guess, I look after the Southern Rocky Mountains Management Plan, which you're mostly familiar. I'm the chair of the committee. I look after Cranbrook West Recreation Management, Golden Recreation Management, the Kootenai Boundary and the Revelstoke Higher Level Plans. We're working on a plan now from Kukan uh, around Kukanusa Lake, which has, it's turned into an official community plan, but we're also working on the, uh, combining it with um, First Nations interests and the provincial interests to try to make it more than just an OCP. We're also doing some stuff on Kootenai Lake. In all this, um, one thing that's been really important to me is this fellow sitting right here, Mr. Bennett, has been, I call him the father of the plans over here. And one thing when he's at is that I go to dad when I need money or support for things and Bill's been very generous on providing that and helping me out there. The other thing is, through all this change in the stuff that's going on, Tony Wodeski is the district manager of Forest here. He's provided support and continued to fund me, although we've been in six or seven different ministers until the end of March, anyhow, he's provided the, the funding and support and a desk for me to sit at. I'm still on the same desk I was before. One of the things that I've been um, trying to do as a chair of these committees, it'd be very easy, I guess as Carmen said, if I just had to make Carmen happy, it, it wouldn't take me very long. I'd just have to sit down and wait. But unfortunately, there's other people who have different opinions on things, and often they're just as strong as Carmen's um, 
Mr. Brzezinski is our uh, example, and these people have to be heard and listened to, and somewhere in there I'm supposed to stop them from killing each other at these meetings, and some are very exciting meetings. <laughs> But we've got through it, we do talk to each other, we, go, we um, are working through, we're starting our round of spring meetings and uh, when it's done, I don't know exactly what we're going to get out of it, but we're, we're at least talking to each other, we're listening to the people who are, Mr. Galloway, who, who's uh, very strong on the ATV side, to people who are uh, equally strong on the other side who don't want any access for anything. So that's what I do for a living. I have done a lot of uh, owl research for about 10 years, and I just helped Carmen out. The barred owls right now in Oregon, they're talking about shooting 4,700 owls to help save the 12 spotted owls. And I kind of wonder how you're going to go about shooting 4,700 owls. And other than that, I just have one little thing. I've been doing a hardwood floor, and I've got a huge cramp coming on in my leg, so if I leap up and start screaming, it's not in wild support of anything. It's just a cramp, <laughs> and I'll try to get out of the room. Thank you, and we'll see you on the floor. Thanks, Stuart. You guys can ask them questions and ask them how this process is done. I, uh, I, I have difficulty with the process I, uh, because down the road uh, the person I vote for is the one I'm going to hold accountable uh, to whether or not I'm using the bush or not using the bush and the government's in power that's who I'm going to hold accountable in the long term and the bureaucrats are fine to make decisions but I didn't vote for them when I see some of my best road places uh, being trashed and every side road in places like Hawkins Creek and the Lumberton and other places being trashed. I, I have a bit of trouble with that. I want to know. I want you to know that one of my good friends here, Dave Reeves. He he uh, he he's go. We go back quite a long t long ways. And Dave is a huckleberry picker of renown. Something like my other friend here, Alan Endersby, and his wife Agnes. Well, he is. They sell huckleberry pies and jam, and they make. Uh, they pick about 125 to 135 gallons of huckleberries a year on a good year. And I show them my huckleberry patches. And the reason I do that is because Dave takes and Grace take those huckleberry uh, and they, they make some money with them. And they take all the money that they make from picking those huckleberries and they send it to an orphanage where they look after 60 to 70 uh, people who have no life like we have. And so it's not a greedy thing that they're doing. And their work, to me, if the bears will find the huckleberries, we don't have to worry about whether there's enough for bears or not. But there should be more for guys like Dave Reeves, who actually take that natural resource and put it to really good use. Dave was my pastor for a number of years. And uh, he's a, he's, he's a stiff-necked man in lots of ways. He, you can't, he doesn't vary much. And he's, he's very stubborn. Um, he has a passion, uh, and he, you, you couldn't get him convinced in one way or another to change his mind. He is very straight about what he does. So he's going to talk to us today. He's going to give us a presentation. And uh, Dave's a hunter. He's a fisherman. He's a family man, grandfather. I don't know if he's a great-grandfather yet. I guess great he is. Yeah. And, uh, and I know a little bit about that as well. So Dave, welcome. Thank you, Carmen. I want to tell you a story, a sad story, a sad, sad story of my journey from riches to rags. More than 40 years ago, I came to this wonderful Kootenai country. During those first few weeks, I remember driving my young family in our full-sized four-door Ford sedan, for I had no 4x4, four four, and I really needed no 4x4. Four four. I drove my family leisurely some six miles up Buell Creek in the Skookum Truck drainage. I took them up Nine Mile Creek, right to the Alpine in the Kootenai drainage. I drove my family to the top end of Mouse Creek, way past Fisher Peak, to the old historic 
Victor Mine Site, just below the Tarns. Having been born on the prairies, I was delighted to be able to have free access to what we know is the best backyard in the world. Once upon a time, we were able to get back there every chance we got. Today our chances are not so good because there has been a deliberate move to regulate, restrict, and blockade our entry into our own backyard. Those were the good old days, but sadly they are long gone. And a new regime of rules, restrictions, regulation, and of physical obstacles now prevent us from accessing our own beautiful backyard. In those days, I was a very happy outdoorsman. And it was like I just received two million dollars. Oh, how rich and wealthy I was. Along came a young government biologist, Ray DeMarchi, who got together with the GGs, the Greenies, the Guides, the Grass Greedy Ranchers, and government bureaucrats, a combination I still call the GGs. And they said, Dave, it's not right for you to continue to enjoy your whole two million dollars. Quite quickly he imposed a plan to take away a major portion of what I'd been enjoying as a hunter. He introduced an ever-expanding cancer called vehicle access closures that virtually gave exclusive hunting rights to his game guide friends. Other GGs, led by draft dodgers, got busy and locked up large tracts of wilderness, placing them in parks, biological reserves, and wilderness conservancies. Well, like the St. Mary's Plateau, height of the Rockies, more recently Gilnaki. They then set their sights on the very best open lands, calling them access management areas. AMAs, I call them areas against all motorized access. For cattle and horses continue to overgraze and degrade everything that's forbidden to me. The GGs next snuggled up to the forest industry and began destroying publicly funded infrastructure pulling bridges, deactivating roads, using gates, kelly humps, and tank trap sized cross ditches that simply make me cross when crossing them. Their real purpose is not to keep silt out of the streams, but to keep you and I out of our own backyard. All this further depleted what I once had. My two million dollars was now something like one million. Along came, uh, f first of all, my two million dollars get down to one, but guess what? Horses, cattle, gave up, sweet, nothing. I lost half of what I had, but they gave up, sweet, nothing. Along came a government bureaucrat named Kevin Weaver. Somebody said his name sounds like weasel. I shouldn't say that. But along came Kevin Weaver as a front man for the GGs. And he said, now Dave, it's not right for you to continue to enjoy your million dollars. We need a recreational plan like Golden like the Elk Valley. And we want to talk to you about introducing one here in the Cranbrook area. So selected stakeholders talked about a recreation management plan. And I pause to say thank you to Bill Bennett. He made it possible for me to sit at that table. 
I sat there representing seniors who like to use ATVs or quads. He got me a space at the table. And we spent more than two years at that table talking about a recreation management plan. But I found out that my million dollars was going to be drastically depleted quite quickly. They did not want any off-road vehicles to ever go off a road. Did you get that? They did not want any off-road vehicles to ever go off a road. What an oxymoron. We were to give up all alpine areas, complete with all avalanche slides. We were to give up not only the riparian areas, that's the wetlands, which made sense, but they were going to impose a needless buffer zone around all riparian areas so that you could never even get a glimpse of the lake if you were riding a quad. They said stay out of all watersheds and keep off all the grass. Now, I'm not a marijuana party man, so keeping off the grass maybe sounded good. <laughs> oh, we must never bend a blade of grass under a low pressure ATV tire. They must all be saved for digestion in the belly of a beef. We must stay off the best winter ranges, even in the summer. That floored me because we had a winter map, we had a summer map. But ATVs were not to encroach on winter range even in the summer. It's strange that once again horses and cattle continue to be allowed to degrade what really amounts to free range for them. While we subsidize the building of high fences around their hay fields, leaving game animals only the leftovers on the outside of the fence that the cattle leave after their spring and summer overgrazing. I had hoped by cooperating in the flawed process, rather than lose-lose, there might be at least a little gain for motorized recreation. For I was representing senior ATV riders. So I asked for the lifting of some vehicle access closures that were no longer biologically needed. But I was routinely refused. So I thought I'd try a little test and ask for the return of at least a little less than two kilometers that had been recently taken away from me at the top end of Mouse Creek, where 40 years ago I had driven in the family car. But now it is blockaded a couple of kilometers away from the Tarns and the Victor Mine site. Though the majority at the table agreed with me, the GGs again said no. And somehow their voice always seemed to veto even the majority because of the green bias of the government sent facilitator. However, they did say, now Dave, we're not going to totally wipe you out of off-roading. So every time we looked at a management area, I said, is this the one where I can ride my ATV around the trees in the park light areas? And they would always say, well, no, not this one. No, not this one. Now, Dave, we are not going to title, totally wipe you out of off-road quadding. Though you once did have two million dollars, we'll leave you a little bit of off-roading for ATVers that you can We'll give you something to subsist on. But I found that the only map the only place where we were able to circle and say, this is an ATV area, it was so steep, rocky, and heavily forested 
that writing would not be pleasurable, it wouldn't even be possible. But it was the backyard of a game guide who was not in favor with the Gigi's. I sat at that recreation table not because I wanted to limit my access, but because I hoped to lessen the losses that were seemingly pre-planned for me. The new plan took away my last million dollars and left me with what seemed to be two or three grand. How could I support a plan that brought me enormous loss and did not even remove one vehicle access closure? or open one lock gate, or restore a single kilometer of closed roadway. I felt like a titled landowner who wakes up one sad, sad morning to find out that without any democratic vote, an oppressive government has craftily taken over the country, confiscated my former properties. This new heavy-handed power then requires that I submit in silence and publicly endorse the new regime that has taken away most of my former rights, privileges, and freedom. Friends, I came to a fork in the road when I could either cave in to the peer pressure around that stakeholder's table cave into the peer pressure of political correctness that was promoted as being best for the common good. Or I could refuse to sign on to the flawed agreement that I deemed to be excessively oppressive. I chose not to sign. Because I would not sign, I was no longer allowed to speak or put any input at the table. And yet they claim all stakeholders approve this plan. You know, too often the Canadian way is to meekly to go along to get along. The old better red than dead philosophy of appeasement, where people are unwilling to stand and be counted or to lay down their life for something important. I believe there are things worth dying for. Rather than capitulate, I became ready to begin the big battle to try and regain some of the lost privileges, rights, and freedoms. And so I gladly endorse and support Carmen Purdy's program of Access BC. His efforts to get our own backyard are worth backing. I really didn't have much to lose. The GGs had brought me to the brink of bankruptcy and left me without a buffer zone. They more or less took the very shirt off my back and impoverished the whole lot of us. They have plundered and plunged us into a poverty of access. That's my sad story of my journey from riches to rags. That's my friend Dave Reeves. I love the guy. It's um, time to do the draw here. Does anybody else want an arm's length? Is everybody in the bucket? I'm going to ask uh, my friend to. Oh, there's one. And then we're going to have coffee. Um, and we'll break for about 20 minutes. And during the break, this is a, uh, $1,000. This is the way we're going to be hunting in the future. <laughs> um, I, I want Bob Ferris to stand up. It was Bob Ferris' son-in-law last, last week or weekend that had the wreck. And uh, 
I'll tell you what, there's one passionate guy about using the resources and he's excellent at it. Plus he's very passionate about what we do and he puts his money where his mouth is. And thank you very much, Bob Ferris. <laughs> this is going to be drawn. Um, I should do a little commercial for Bob. I understand that he's getting, uh, he's getting uh, rifles in this year at some point. And so, and he sells hunting licenses and so forth too. He has True Flight Archery. He's the only real archer, uh, archery shop in the Kootenays. And, and he's, he's excellent at it. He, he's a skilled, skilled man in terms of what he does. And uh, we should support him as local business. Anybody who's doing archery tackle and so forth, you should go to him. He's, he's one of the best. Plus he's a trapper. Plus he's a logger. He knows his country like the back of his hand. And he knows uh, how we can solve a lot of these problems that we're dealing with in terms of access. And so I am really, we're really lucky to have him on the board of directors of Access British Columbia. And uh, he, keeps, he keeps, the, keeps me in line. It's hard to do. This is going to be the last thing we draw, actually. And the method's going to be with, I call it the card auction. It's, it's not an auction, really, but it, it, it's an auction that's good enough for me. And all of these items here are going to go. Uh, the spotting scope it was donated by Alan Gordon. And everybody knows the Gordon family. Snowmobile oil from uh, Jepson Petroleum, of course, the down quilt and Canadian tire, and also the, uh, the, the, the rod holder was from, from Alan Gordon's family as well. The eliminator was from uh, Superstore, or uh, Carpet Superstore. Mike can't be here today, or he would have been with all the guys from the shotgun group out at, uh, out at Wycliffe. They need members there too, so anybody who wants to go shotgunning, that's a place to go. I'm going to ask, uh, Dave, are you ready? I was just trying to figure it out. What else do we have here? Good stuff. The tickets are $20 for one card, $50 for three cards. $100 for seven cards. If you figure it out, there's two decks. If 15 guys come up and buy $100, that's it. You're going to win some. So there you go. And this is the last draw. This is the one. I'm going to put 100 bucks up right now. So Rob, would you bring some cards up here? Rob. And if I win, it's going to go to one of my fine, strong grandsons when I die. <laughs> so, Bill, would you draw that one? So, if you want, if you want to get in on this, you got to line up here, and then, or else have coffee. And uh, what's half? Four hundred and ten dollar winner is got your card, got your ticket in front of you right now. It's four four nine five zero six, four four nine five zero six, four four nine five zero six, four four nine five zero six. David, bring the bucket because he needs it. he needs the bucket for the other one. The number is four four nine five zero six. You got to come up and get 50% of this. 449506. We need the bucket, Dave. I'm not going to draw another one. I'm not going to draw another one because that's this is we're talking about too much money. Is somebody out of the room. Four four nine five zero oh, six. Do you want my knife? I'll get you a pair of scissors. 
Could somebody go out to the desk and get a pair of scissors, please? 449506. I'm just thinking it was Scott Manjack. <laughs> What do you guys want me to do? Okay, for the last time, 449506. Sorry about that. Yeah. Let's draw another one then. Oh, was he sleeping? Too late. Tell him it's too late. Too late. <laughs> well, there you go. We we got the winner. So could I please have everyone take it, their seats? I was going to tell a grizzly story <clears throat> to begin with this afternoon and there's several of them around. We've all had grizzly stories that were close calls or whatever. I had a big uh, debate with uh, the board of directors of the Nature Trust. Of, I've been a director of the Nature Trust for 20 years and have had, along with you guys like Mario and, and Don, and, uh, right across the, the, the spectrum here, we've been buying land for uh, wildlife since 1980 when we first started the Kootenai Wildlife Heritage Fund, when we first started the, the Wildlife Habitat Conservation Fund. We started that fund because in 1979, uh, we had a winter that was looking like one that we had in 96, 97. And we had 42 inches of snow on the winter range. And uh, it was, we needed to feed. Uh, we tried to get government to feed, they wouldn't feed. Uh, we met with um, a group of politicians here in Cranbrook. Mario was a part of that. Uh, Barry, Barry Barney Caulfield, myself, um, Skyber, and Dave. No, Don wasn't. Dave Malinka with Mok was there. And so we wanted to put a tax on timber and coal, uh, 10 cents a cubic meter uh, for each one and there were 10 cents a, a ton for coal. And we were told flatly that we couldn't do that. So we asked if they would do a voluntary tax on our hunting, fishing, trapping licenses and that we would pay willingly to protect habitat for wildlife. 
It was pretty well turned on except for uh, a minister of agriculture out of uh, Kelowna who said this would work and subsequently they, they put that together. Uh, by 1981, in by 1980 in December, we had a really bad snowstorm that happened for about six weeks. We had 42 inches of snow in the winter range in the East Kootenai. Uh, Skookumchuk, the snow was over the fences and uh, we asked for feed and start to, out of the Habitat Conservation Fund that was formed. And uh, they wouldn't give us the money. So we formed the Kootenai Wildlife Heritage Fund. I'm telling you this story because it's essential that hunters and, and fishermen, trappers and guide outfitters uh, stick together on issues concerning wildlife. I always found that those who are most concerned about it are those who use the resource. And when the resource is not utilized, it becomes a pest. Like we have pests in town now, they call called mule deer. And the same thing in Kimberley. Now a lot of people would be, uh, say that's not true, but they have them on Vancouver Island, lots of the small islands there. And many of the places are being uh, over, over browsed by deer and they're having difficulty. In fact, in Victoria, they can't even decide how they're going to kill a bunch of rabbits under a hospital. They got to ship them to Texas. <laughs> it's interesting what happens when you get hunters doing it though, and guys who really do care and love the resource. I remember my first grizzly bear encounter. I was, I was young. I was 14. I was in the Pedley Creek. That was my first real caribou encounter in the East Kootenai as well. I, on, on Pedley Creek Road, we ran into four caribou in, in September. And that was really interesting. When I tell the caribou biologists that I ran into four caribou, they always ask the same question. Are you sure they were caribou? Carmen, they still ask me that question. I saw two bulls along the road down by the eagle nest there that got their antlers gone and I phoned into the caribou specialist and said, I saw two caribou on the highway and she said, are you sure they were caribou? I said, no, I think Santa lost two of them on the way through. <laughs> but <laughs> grizzly were on common in the Kootenays when I first started hunting in the middle 1950. In fact, if you saw one, you would spend the day looking at them. I remember lots of times hunting sheep that I would just quit looking for sheep and I would watch a grizzly for the full day. My good friend Alan Andersby and I had a lot of times when we were close to bears. And I remember hunting uh, in the Gibraltar area with big bear uh, in front of me and was gonna shoot him and then I thought, no, I can't shoot him and they were open. Uh, we have to pack this sucker out of here and he was really big. It was on the Moscow Creek side. It would take them two days to get him out of there. Another time we were picking uh, huckleberries and hunting goats in a place called Whitewater Creek. And we could hear the bears moving through Whitewater Creek, huckleberry patch on the top end. And Alan leaned over to me and said, because he wasn't sleeping very well, he didn't like to sleep right under the stars. And he said, I hope to take the fattest ones first. <laughs> <laughs> Alan was watching the Sputnik go across the sky that night. And now next morning, um, I killed a goat and Alan didn't. He chased the big yellow billy and didn't. But we were hunters and there was bear sign everywhere there. And walking through the huckleberry patch, Dave Reeves would like this. My legs were purple and they were just big heavy berries hanging with little leaves on. They were just, it was perfect. But I tell you th these stories because about seven years ago, I was hunting with Kurt in the Elk Valley for sheep and by 10 o'clock in the morning we had seen 10 grizzlies. I was in a flathead with Bobby Fontana and we walked back into a spot and by 6 o'clock at night I was going to shoot a big mule deer and Bobby said you know we got to walk out of here in the dark Carmen and I said I know well I wouldn't be shooting them then. We saw 13 bears that day. This is after they recu re recovered, and we've been managing for predators. This is important. We've been managing for predators in the Kootenays since 1970. That turn came with Dr. McTaggart Cohn, who was a very close uh, uh, friend of mine. I mean, he hunted from my house and learned a lot of stuff that he didn't know as a teacher of biology. He was a dean of the faculty. 
I highly regarded Dr. McTaggart Cowan. He was a very, very special person. And when he came to hunt elk in the Kootenays, he said, I, I, you know, I'm 80 years old, Carm. I can't climb into the high basins anymore. I said, I wouldn't take you in any high basins, Ian. We can hunt right from the back doorstep. This is in the early 80s, 81, 82. And uh, I bugled three or four six-point bulls right into them on the valley bottom here. In that same valley bottom, between Fort Steele and Wassa, or, yeah, Fort Steele and Wassa, talking to the rancher there one morning, I said to him as I was hunting black bear in there, I said, there's a bunch of grizzlies in here, I've seen five. He said, Carmen, there's 12 here this spring. They're still, they're there in the valley bottom. They're between Fort Steele and they're there every year. We have bears. Actually, our hunting season uh, is, so, is so limited on grizzly bears now in the Kootenays and throughout the Kootenays that it could be called non-hunting. In many years, the Conservation Officer Service kills more bears, grizzly bears, than we do. In the West Kootenay, where it's very difficult to get a grizzly bear tag, I know there has been years when the conservation officer there had killed more grizzlies than we harvested in, in that section of, of country. Um, I'm not telling my friends that I'm going to introduce anything new. They know that stuff. But it's interesting to me that we should be using them, that we should be harvesting them. We're managing them really well, where they're increasing. Uh, we have, if we take those old boars out, we leave room for the babies and the mothers. And I always say if you take care of the mothers and the babies, you're pretty much going to be okay. We, we have done that to the point of where we're going to be in predator pit conditions. Caribou, the two million acre caribou place, the caribou are finished. I've talked to seven, like I told you earlier, biologists who I have, one of them was Ian. Will they survive? Absolutely not. When you have grizzly bears, black bears, cougars, wolves, Coyotes, bobcat, lynx, ravens, and eagles that are eaten on calves every spring. One of the properties we bought here not long ago is the 10,000 acre hoodoo at near Fairmont. Good, good acquisition. When I first tried to get it, we could have got it for a million three. We ended up paying 4.3, but a million three was, was a bargain. 4.3 is two. It's a 10,000 acre piece. There's bears and wolves and moose and so forth. But we have 450 to 500 elk that winter on that this year. And it's through good management, multiplying resources by doing certain things on that property with Rob Neal, who also is a, is a, a wildlife biologist whom I respect for his wildlife biology. What Rob's actually one of the ones who said to me that caribou won't make it. He said, <clears throat> we have 17 calves per hundred cows on a 500 unit, 500 cows and calves, 500 elk, 17. The carryover this year is 17. 17 isn't enough. 17 calves making it isn't enough. And we're not shooting calves here to the degree that we think we are. These are migrating out of places. The back end there in Dutch, Toby and places like that. 17 calves. We're not, we're not hunting them. The natives aren't killing them. Those critters are being hard hit by wolves, grizzly bears, black bear, cougar, bobcat, lynx, ravens, eagles. Ravens kill a lot of game. When the calving season's on, they, in the, in the, especially if it's a new calf, first time calf or first time fawn, the ravens will follow and march them. And as soon as the, the fawn, the cow or the doe go down, the raven's waiting, and as soon as that little guy comes out, they pick their eyes out, they pick their nose off, they eat their tongue, and if they have any difficulty at all, and the mother can't get up, they'll kill her too. This isn't gloom gloom. This is that we can't, we got to manage, and manage means harvest, and harvest means access. Without access, without access to resources, we don't do the things that we do. And wildlife populations are based in game management is based on numbers, limited entry. We can do the management systems really well and increase and multiply those resources by use hunters, number of hunters in the field, and the number of game or animals you want to take from that population. You have to know the numbers, though. 
And in my view, I don't think we have the correct numbers uh, on grizzly bears. I think it's, um, I was going to tell a little bit of a joke here, but I better not. <laughs> this isn't funny. Uh, we have two gentlemen here who agreed to come uh, to talk to us today. And they're looking at uh, my South Country. Uh, Michael Proctor has a, a history and, and long standing with um, managing and working with and, and trapping and relocating and, and doing things for bears over time. Mike Knappick is a, is a uh, habitat biologist out of Nelson. And uh, I know that this is the, the point where I have to say this. Um, we uh, as hunters are respectful as well. And I, I'm sure they'll answer your questions after. But I think we have to know that it has to be asked in, in, with respect. We respect for these gentlemen. They've come here to talk to us. And we certainly have strong positions on it. And they have some biology that they want to put forward to us. And so without any further ado, gentlemen, I'd like give, I'll turn the floor over to you. And we will, after that, we're going to draw this. Um, and then we're going to do our, our AGM, which shouldn't take more than the time that it did last year, about three minutes. So, Mike. That was the one that won for 130 <laughs> bucks. It wasn't me. <laughs> Just gotta move that. So, um, about a month or so ago, I had a, the opportunity. Well, I was asked to um, attend a meeting at Bill Bennett's office with uh, Carmen and some of uh, the other Access guys, and. Um, it was a good meeting. I think we'd still be there if it wasn't for ben, uh, Bill having to get out for uh, business lunch. It was, <laughs> it went on, but it was a, it was a good meeting. It was a good opportunity to meet some of some of you there. So I, I had a, a better appreciation for the positions you take. And quite honestly, I I, I don't want to disappoint anybody, but my positions as as well as Michael's isn't much different than yours. I want to start off by saying that Michael's going to say the same, but there are some differences that. <coughs> I'd like to talk about, and there, there are certainly perspectives I need you to understand too. I guess from the seat, the seat that I sit in uh, as a senior biologist in Nelson. This kind of began with me. The, the reason I got called to uh, attend that meeting, uh, it, was, it was in the community that grizzly bears in particular, I hope I'm not really sounding too loud here, this is really kind of intimidating. Um, Grizzly bears equals road closures or access management or AMA is whatever you want to call it. And um, it, it was really getting that moniker and it was a little bit distressing for some of us because um, while it, there's an association of sorts to it, we just uh, were concerned that it was getting a bit blown out of proportion. And having the opportunity, as Carmen put it, to, for me to come here, the AGM to, to explain that was really a, a great opportunity, honestly. I am. As, as intimidating as this might seem to be, it was, it was really a good opportunity for me to, to basically explain things a bit better where everybody's hearing the same message. Because quite honestly, like anything else, things kind of, uh, through the grapevine, stories change and uh, opinions kind of get formed based on what the next person says. And, and um, I think this is the time to, to kind of go through some of that. Part of my role in government is to follow government direction from Victoria. And that's what regional people or people in districts have to contend with. And my involvement in, in particularly this issue that we'll give you a good example on, it's a, it's a good example because we're going to talk about something more specific here than access as a provincial uh, perspective because um, I think it's relevant. And I think as, a, as an Access BC member, um, what the, the simple message I want everybody to leave with at the end of this is the number of stakeholders that I tend to have to be involved with uh, on a day-to-day -day or at least week-to-week -week basis, right from First Nations to all kinds of uh, backcountry outdoor users, um, the relevance for Access BC is big in that you have an opportunity not to be what I don't want you to be as a lobbyist because I don't tend to talk with or get involved with anyone that's considering themselves as a lobbyist because that's 
political, and that's out of my realm. But as an activist, uh, it's good for you to understand each other's roles. I understand your role. I hope you understand mine at the end of today, because only then can we have a, a meaningful debate about it. And the relevancy here, as I'll get to at the end, when we, when we meet at a table like the Cranbrook West, those uh, committees that Stu Clow was talking about earlier, are those opportunities for myself and for Michael and for yourselves particularly to explain your situation and to both understand where we're all coming from. So with, with that said, I also wanted to uh, reiterate what uh, Dave had said earlier in his talk and I completely agree with. I had to write it down and I am 100% behind what he says. We should not be taking away reasonable access. The word reasonable. And uh, I'm not interested in taking a lot of access away. I'm not interested in taking 98% of the access away from anybody. That's not my role. But certainly there are things that have happened in, in recent years that have turned our mind to this a bit more. And this is a great way to interface with people like you who've got very hard and understandable reasons why we need to keep access open. So with that, I began with a process back in 19, uh, sorry, 2006. I should start way back then. I'll have to leave left room for Michael to give his talk. But back in 2006, the specific example I'm going to explain to you is uh, the yak grizzly bear population, which is um, one that we'll spend most time talking about now. It's one that received what the government calls threatened population status. Anybody that's hunted a grizzly bear here knows that each population is managed on a unit by unit basis. We have a provincial number, but the way Fish and Wildlife manages those populations is by specific areas and units. And the, the Yak population unit, which is a defi very defined area, has, has shown to um, believe what they call below 50% of their carrying capacity. There's debate about that number, but for, for you to understand what that means, in terms of the government's perspective and how they manage hunts, that means 50% of the, of the animals don't exist, or that should exist in that population unit. So we're below 50% of what should be there. I'll let Michael to go into a bit of the biology of why that's uh, important to improve that uh, population for the benefit of all grizzly bear uh, populations, particularly the, the area north of there in the Purcells. It's got very sound hunting rationales why we should continue to be concerned about those fringe populations because it has an effect ultimately on the future of other populations. So back in t 2008, uh, I, w I formed um, a working group primarily with the forest industry. When I said that population was considered threatened, uh, what that allowed me as a, as a habitat biologist, I should tell you that I, my role is not a hard biologist. My role mostly is the knowledge of forest legislation and how it interfaces with uh, wildlife habitat concerns. So I've got 20 years of experience at that. And uh, the ability for me now to take this, to, to bring forest legislation in to provide some protection measures for the yak grizzly bear population is what I was doing since 2007. So a year after the, the population was declared threatened, it, it gave me an opportunity to find a way with forest industry to identify specific measures that only relate to forestry. And that's an important factor for everybody to know because there's been criticism that's sort of gone out that uh, there's been issues with grizzly bear and the yak and we're just now finding out about it. And uh, it was somewhat systematic where you talk about issues related to habitat protection that only forestry can have some bearing or effect on. That's the, that's the stakeholder group we focus in on. Otherwise, we'd have a room as big as this of stakeholders that we'd have to explain things, get agreements on. So we focused on just that particular group. Fast forward you up until just um, a month or so ago, we've, uh, I've submitted that, what they call a government action regulation order. It's an order that only applies to the forest industry. They, they must abide by specific measures on how they perform forest operations around certain habitat types and uh, how they can protect certain values like huckleberry. Vaccinia management is really important. And so um, at that working group level, 
it was believed because Michael was a very staunch report, uh, supporter of the group the whole while that access at some point in time would likely need to be talked about. Not access for industry or access control just for industry, but if we're serious about managing grizzly bear populations, access has to be considered at the broadest spectrum of, of um, restriction. So all users. So that doesn't mean just forestry, and that doesn't mean forest legislation. It means a different type of legislation that we now want to engage everybody in. So nobody's missed out on anything. We're the, when I said earlier, this is the opportunity for us to sit and chat with you uh, about what those specific concerns are. We're going to do that with you. And in hopes, um, no decisions are made. This is all still in principle and in theory. Um, what we'd like to see and how we'd like to engage Access BC as a member of one of those uh, advisory committees like uh, the Cranbrook West. We find those committees um, convenient because they're, they're stakeholders that are already assigned and we know who you are and it's easy to draw information from you as opposed to have to go looking for you. So those types of committees that Stu is responsible for now are, real, are really valuable to people like me because it gets me a direct connection to the people I need to speak with. The other aspect of, of meeting uh, at, at a table like that, and it's my hope, and I hope that you believe this, that we come to a decision together. I, I heard Dave say, you know, he was a part of the table, and I wasn't there, Dave. I don't know what, how you were treated. But it's our belief that nobody, that, that positions, or decisions don't get made unless, at the very least, everybody understands what the concerns are. And that's, uh, that's, that's really leading me why, why I brought Michael with me, because uh, it all starts with that. I don't like to throw anything out there as an access management issue or a, a restriction to your public right to um, access Crown land without your understanding of what that issue is. If you don't agree with that issue, that's fine. Uh, we're, we don't force it down your throat either. You all have minds and you can all think for yourselves. We're not here to tell you that. We're just here to explain what we know. And as Michael will say, it's all about data. Just a quick plug about data and scientific proof. The government put us in a bit of a spot, not a spot, a, a, a bit of a place in our job 10 years ago where we're required now to provide that scientific evidence before we can make these kinds of decisions. Decisions eventually can get made, and they often get made at a political level. But it behooves us at the district and regional level to be explaining things to people so they understand what we believe to be the problems are. And so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Proctor. Um, some of you have talked with him already. Some of you know him through the newspaper, through his work on Jumbo. Um, I thought it was an opportunity. If, you, if you've only have heard about Michael, it's a good opportunity now to hear directly from him so you can see where he's coming from, how he's been a help to me anyway. And uh, hopefully uh, what I'd ask is at the end, I think Carmen said, ask all the questions you want. If we don't know the answer, we're very quick to tell you we don't know. You know put that down. So uh, without that, uh, Michael Proctor. And so we might need to have some lights turned off as well. Hey, uh, I got a loud voice. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. I, I uh, never know where these talks are going, so I have to look at the slides occasionally. And Nature Trust the BC. Yeah, it's Rob Neal. He's a good I'm guy. He's an ecologist. He's a real good guy. He said, "Yeah, we'll take. We'll uh, they, they manage it for wildlife, for all wildlife. They manage, I'm pretty sure they like to leave hunting on there. I met a guy. He said, "Did you guys buy this property?" I said, "Yeah, how's the hunting?" And he said, oh, "Pretty good. He's walking the thing." So one of the things we could do instead of killing roads, if the forest companies would grade the roads on the way out, and you mentioned food, 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 and if they uh, they took uh, clover sod forming grasses to hold the road edges in place you would have more bear habitat than you could shake a stick at. The other question you have to ask is how many bears is enough? And what kind of bears? Do you want old boars that are there that are, I think that they kill a lot of sows and they kill a lot of young, young bears? And the wolves, of course, now, uh, in the yak, have a huge influence on, on young bears 
and uh, and old bears too if they decide. Well, we'll, yeah, uh, fair enough. You know, like I say, I'm trying to. I like to have these populations. I think you probably got enough bears in flat. I don't think you need to manage for more bears. I mean, you're completely right. What I was trying to get across is you're in Cranbrook. You look to the flathead. You got millions of bears. You look over to the yak. You don't. You, I think. Uh, Perfect. They're not going to, well, I know, that could be, that's <laughs> fair enough. I'm not here to tell you how to think. If, if, you, if you do want those bears, uh, you know, um, if you don't, well, then we're done. That's good. I, I'm not easy. I actually spent a lot of time in that country, and yeah. from 1968 until about well, last year, I've hunted uh, the, that Stone Creek, uh, Sundown Creek. My trap line is Hawkins Creek. I had Hawkins Creek yeah, for a long time. Yeah, I love that place, man. I worked and, there for four years. And uh, my moose populations have crashed pretty much mainly because of wolves, I think, but cougar and grizzlies. And the caribou, the caribou question. We're trying to save caribou, and if you put more teeth and claws in the caribou habitat, I mean, they're gone anyway, but... Well, south yeah. of, the, of the yak, caribou are out. I, I'm not going to comment anywhere yeah. else. I tend to agree with everybody, but I don't want to... I yeah. don't want to talk about caribou. I'm not well, even in the s southern Selkirks there, with the numbers they have, unless yeah. they do something it's a there, tough question. It, it's it's gone. I mean, we're, so you either manage for bears or you manage for caribou, or you you know we don't need to lock up a whole bunch more country. But if we looked after those roads in a way where we we seeded them on the way out when those big yellow machines left, it's not the guys like me and you and everybody going there in the winter time, the summertime, the fall that are real concerns to bears. Bears go wherever they feel like. And the flathead is a good example. I spent 200 kilometers in a couple of days. I never run out of bear tracks. Never ran out of them, actually. And uh, down in the Hawkins Creek area, they haven't been there for a long period of time. They may have been lost before, but I'd, it was before my time and before I went in there and, and used it a it's lot. It's not the greatest habitat. The government has a, 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 cap a capability estimate there, you know, where they have that 50%. And uh, I, I'll go ahead and say to the world that that estimate's probably too high. Yeah. Uh, I don't consider that uh, that that's correct. Uh, uh, you know, that, that's their system. I didn't. I just brought data to the table and plugged it into their uh, assessment system. And I thought, well, that's how they make decisions. It's fair to do that. But yeah. their system is too high. I think that it, it's not as good. But that doesn't mean it should be zero or you know. No, you I, I don't. Like Kevin, uh, but the number of bears is that if you have old boars there, you're going to have a problem. We should take hunt and direct our hunts toward those old those old boars and then that should increase and that as we manage for bears in the flathead with Bruce McClellan and I was one of the first yep. guys that supported these guys right here were the first, one of the first guys supported Bruce McClellan back in the 70s yep and uh, been one of my gurus uh, yeah. mentors yeah and, and, so, and certainly Bruce knows as much about bears as anybody I know uh, probably and, more yeah <laughs> and he uh, he would I think agree we used to fly the Purcells. He also agrees with all this, just uh, so you know. Yeah, I'm sure he does. Uh, we used to fly the Purcells um, and watch those big bears come all the way out of the field, out of the top end of St. Mary's, going to that, that, that spring range, that breeding range, uh, between Yak and, and Goatfell there, over that in the top and top yep. Irishman in, in Hazel Creek, uh, where there, there were bears there. But over on the other side uh, of the highway, in all the years I hunted there, I never seen a grizzly. In in the in, in, in the Stone Creek sundown sunrise. Yeah, and as you go east, I think it gets less and less. They're definitely in there. We hear reports of the hound hunters running into them. The dogs don't know how to tell the difference, so they yeah. they'll take the grizzly just as much in a year. Is there questions? Yeah, I'm just looking for a, a yeah. Is there questions from the floor before? Go ahead, Bobby. Yes. Looking at that area of grizzly. <laughs> If at some point you want to recruit more South Jersey bears in that area, how do you propose to do it? Because looking at it right now, there's a high number of more grizzly bears by the data that you've gathered. And the age of those grizzly bears are controlling or maybe controlling the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a common theme among some people, some people but it's, it's, it hasn't been, I appreciate it. And, and you know, the, the, in non North America, like in Sweden, that really works. But the Bruce has written a full paper about how that doesn't work here. Uh, he's, you know, he's kind of a, a guru in British Columbia, and he's got a whole paper out. I'll send it to you that says, you know, it's not happening here. We, the data is not supporting that theory very well. It's kind of on the edge. Uh, we've, it, um, I'm, you know, we're sort of working, like I said, towards getting uh, the hunt back in these places. I think, you know, the, the, the like I said, the cell curve is growing up. The, the, the yak is still not doing good. And you know, if you lose hunting in one area, if the bears wink out in the yak, 
then you're just gonna, you know, you're gonna lose it. You just gotta keep eroding at it. To me, you gotta keep bears. If you want to keep the hunt alive, you gotta keep bears uh, down in those periphery areas, even if there's not tons of animals. So then you can hunt them a little bit in. But uh, you know, everything, like I said, almost everything, every research anybody does is outside of habitat manipulation, which is very challenging. And I'm not so sure I want to manipulate habitat and have lots of more bears in the act. I would just sort of have as many bears as the habitat can contain. Uh, but I think they need to improve a little bit. And all the evidence that almost all bear biologists in North America are showing that an excessive human um, presence challenges that when the habitat's good. Before you leave, please subscribe to our channel. It will not only help you stay up to date with our videos, it will also be a nice way to show your support for the volunteers who make this project possible. Thanks for watching, and please tune in again.